So you kept dropping albums. Uh, you know, you dropped Shorty the Pimp in 92. You dropped Get In Where You Fit In in 93. Cocktails in 95. These were all albums that I, I was buying myself and, mm-hmm. and bumping. Um, at one point, though, you decided to leave Oakland and go to Atlanta. Well, the Oakland thing is, um, it just has to do with the, the streets that I ran through and the people that I hung out with and the shit that was going on with them at the time. And, uh, I mean, point blank period, everybody knows the story. The fucking town split up in two. And not, not the entire town, but a whole bunch of people. And the numbers in the hundreds fucking all were cool with each other. And then all of a sudden, fucking weren't cool. And it was, a, it was kill or be killed in a small ass town. And the numbers don't lie. In 1992, 1993, the homicide rate in Oakland was higher than it's ever been before or after. And we know Oakland has been violent. We know some shit about Oakland. And I talked to my young homies and they're like, no, it couldn't. I mean, he's like, man, it couldn't have been violent in such and such year. And I'm like, check the fucking numbers. So when I show huh. him, 92 and 93, it was a lot of fucking killing. It was a lot of fucking shooting. And it was everybody that I knew personally, like my homies doing it to each other. And I just, I went to the Freak Nick and had the time of my life. The Freak Nick was always my birthday weekend. In Atlanta. I, in Atlanta, Georgia. I had the time of my motherfucking life. And I came back, to, came back home to Oakland. I, I went to Freak Nick for a weekend, stayed for two weeks. Came back to Oakland and I was like, I fucking love Atlanta. And mind you, for one year of my life, when I was in like piece of the seventh grade to piece of the eighth grade, my mother moved to Atlanta, and I went to school out there and everything. I stayed in Atlanta for like one year, and I always had, I always knew Atlanta. Lived in College Park, Old National Highway. So when I got back in '93, and and saw the Freak Nick shit, I just kept thinking like, you know, my homie had showed me, um, my homie, uh, Tony O asked me, uh, he was like. I don't know how it came up. I was like, I'm about to buy a house in Oakland Hills. I'm about to give me a house down a private road, you know, something fly. He was like, shit, how much you gonna spend? I was like, shit, probably, I don't know, five, six hundred thousand, I don't know. And he was like, let me show you what you get in Atlanta for five hundred thousand. <laughs> and they were showing me houses. I was like, you fucking kidding me. And then it's the freak neck. I'm looking at these big ass houses that cost three hundred fifty thousand. Right. Big I, ass I, yard. I went to your house in Oak, in, uh, in Atlanta that one yeah. time. Yeah, I, a nice house. <laughs> so I get back to Oakland and it's like murder, death, kill, murder, murder. You gotta like ride around at all times with a pistol. You gotta fucking really like watch who you fuck with. Really like uh can't let motherfuckers know where you live and shit. Can't, you know, it's just everything started getting real, like the rules changed because it's a small town and you got you know, dozens of motherfucking killers on the prowl looking to kill somebody. And motherfuckers, my homies told me, it was like, man, you still hanging around so-and-so and them, huh? I'm like, yeah, you know, bullets don't have no names, short, huh? I'm like, okay, well, so. What was it over exactly? Uh, you could say a lot of shit. I, if you want my version, you gotta ask around, ask, ask around, because it's, I hear different stories. And my version was, uh, there was some, some, some kind of uh, lower level money guys at a dice game at a park one day. And it was some upper level money guys in the same dice game. And in all dice games, you know, at some point in time, somebody's gonna fight or argue. And the fight broke out. And the, my version is that the, the cat who didn't have the most money kind of quick, quick, bing, 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 and kind of Wanted to fight a little bit. And then that shit escalated to some shit talking and some shit that spilled over to some other shit. And eventually, somebody got knocked the fuck down. Somebody got killed. When somebody got killed, it jumped off a war. But I also feel like that just wasn't behind a dice game and a fucking little friction that happened at a dice game. It was, to me, it was more about the younger motherfuckers or the uh, one set of motherfuckers was like, we run these streets. We really on the pavement. We really in these motherfucking streets. We tell dope. We do all this shit. We kill motherfuckers. We in the streets. 
on the pavement. The other motherfuckers was like, well, motherfucker, we own these streets. We kind of like, you know, sell the most dope and got the most money, and we do it like a real different kind of way where we kind of move like mafioso kings and shit, you know? And it just clashed. So you got the motherfuckers who feed on the pavement, roaming around looking for these other motherfuckers. You got these other motherfuckers who got all this money who could probably just hire somebody or just, you know, it was, it was, a, it was, a, it was, it was a crazy little war, but casualties on both sides, I don't give a fuck who tell you who won, who did the most, who did the sh shit. It shit, uh, I didn't want no parts of it. Cause I wasn't selling dope and I wasn't a motherfucking killer and I wasn't protecting my turf. I wasn't, you know what I'm saying? I'm sitting there looking at these motherfucking strippers and these motherfucking bitches in these Daisy Dukes and just everybody dancing, having a good time going, you know what, I got all this money, man. I think I'm gonna go, go live out in this party for a little while. And I went to this convention called Jack the Rapper. It was probably like, you know, four months after Freak Nick. Got to Jack the Rapper, didn't tell nobody shit, didn't say nothing. I, um, I jumped in the car, went and rode around some of the neighborhoods my homie had showed me, creeped up to the little sales house, the little office where they sell the, sell the houses, and bought a house. <laughs> I bought a house, I gave him three G's to hold my lot and we we'll don't get all the paperwork and do all the shit and give me my, the plans, I, this the house I want built and shit. And I, I about, shit, that was, that was August of 93. I was living in that house by Christmas. Okay. So you showed up in Atlanta mm -hmm. right at the beginning of the Atlanta hip hop scene. I didn't just show up in Atlanta. I showed up in Atlanta. I actually either convinced or helped, or whatever the fuck. I brought a, I brought a whole fucking thing with me, like like dozens of people, like a whole move. I had people moving up from L.A., like my cousins and and folks and shit. Like we about to do the movement, and we showed up. And then we, as soon as we got there, we recruited a gang of motherfucking Bay and L.A. motherfuckers. Like, you know, oh, that's my folks, my folks, that's the folks, okay. And we instantly, like, day one, we just showed up with, like, oh, that's too short now. Like, we were there. Yeah. And it wasn't no, there was no outcast. Yeah. It hadn't happened yet. I mean, Criss Cross probably had one album. Yeah, Jermaine Dupree was out there. It was so, TLC so deaf. TLC had an album out. It was yeah. probably, like, Tony Braxton and Tony yeah, Rich. Yeah, L.A. Reid was out there. Yeah, LaFace was, 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 yep. was the only game in town. So Jermaine and Dallas Austin were kind of, like, you know, extensions of the face. And, you know, when I got there, they were grooming artists like Outkast was about to happen. Um, Monica was about to happen. She was like fucking 12, 13 years old, just a little youngster in the studio. And a lot of shit that we know and love wasn't even in existence yet. It, it wasn't even being groomed or anything yet. So I showed up in Atlanta as Atlanta was really like the, the foundation had been laid. It hadn't really been built up to be you know, it, it, MC Shadi was huge. Fucking, uh, what's my boy in there? Whoop, there it is, tag team. Tag team, yeah. It was, you know, but then those, those were like, more like a, you know, booty shake uh, kind of uh, Miami sounding records. But Too Short showed up. I showed up, when I showed up, I was, um, I'd already had like, Born and Mac was gold. It was Life Is, Short Dogs in the House, and probably Shorty the Pimp. And then, oh yeah, and then I'm um, getting where you fit in. Mm -hmm. So I showed up to Atlanta right before I did cocktails. I made cocktails at Dallas Austin Studio in Atlanta, at Dark Studios. Now you're, you're in Atlanta and you're doing your thing. And I kind of felt like Too Short was, wasn't at his height anymore. And then when you hooked up with Lil John, things, did a 180. Well, we made two platinum albums in Atlanta. We made cocktails, shot the cocktails video. You see the trees in the background with the drop yeah. top. That's Atlanta, all them, all them bitches. That's my house in Atlanta. That was, uh, and then I did Get In Where You Fit In. I, yeah. I did I'm um, Getting It. Getting It was made in Atlanta. I mean, that. Oh, okay. I feel like that, Getting It is where, when I said I retired, and then we came back. When I came back after getting it, what you probably didn't know, and what a lot of people probably didn't know, is 
Ann Banks moved back to the Bay. He stayed in Atlanta for a few years, and it was like he, he moved back and got married and wanted to be close to his family. And I used to make records with Ant Banks, Pee Wee, and Shorty B. And we made, uh, me, Ant Banks, and Shorty B pulled off, um, we did the Shorty the Pimp album. And then after that, when it became Getting Where You Fit In, Getting Where You Fit In, Cocktails, it was four albums. Uh, yeah. Fucking uh, Getting In, and one other, I can't think of. All those albums were just me, Pee Wee, Shorty B, and Ant Banks. Pee Wee was a member of Digital Underground. He wasn't like always in the forefront, but he was in damn near all the videos. So at some point, he played keyboards with Shock G. And we made all those albums, and we had a sound. It was a sound that, when you look back, it's, the, it's a lot of people's favorite songs in that little, that little cluster right there. Mm -hmm. And when I came back off of that retirement, I was kind of like starting to mix and mingle with different producers and different like beat styles. And we did uh, the You Nasty album. We did the Can't Stay Away album, which Shorty B stayed with me, kept that flavor. But I think I was always like, you know, I needed Amp Banks to, to maintain that thing. I needed Amp Banks there 24-7. And I started using my man Taj Tillman, who was a damn good engineer, who saved the day during those years and kept shit real quality. But I still needed Ant Banks, <laughs> you know what I mean? And Banks would always throw me some beats and some shit, but all those times I had Ant Banks from beginning to end, he had a certain touch that when I work with a person like Ant Banks, it's like working with like an Android version of me or some shit, like I got a robot <laughs> that does what I do, that knows what I need to do, but it's gonna do it better than me. And he knew that shit, I knew that shit. I was too short, I had the fucking audience, I had the fucking swag on the records, I had the fucking ink pen to say the shit, you know what I'm saying? And Banks knew how to fucking make that shit perfect. And you know, I think from there, that bridge between Banks to Lil John was a few albums where I even, I made an album one time and my cousin was like, Man, the one thing I listened to you for ain't even on this album. He's like, <laughs> where's the bass? I was like, what? I went back and listened. I was like, damn, I wouldn't fucking made an album and the bass ain't even, like, I, like we live by the bass. Yeah. That was that fucking, um, one of fucking, what's my favorite word? No, it's Chase the Cat album. The bass is not too short bass. It's just not. Right, that was 2001, Chase the Cat. Yeah, so, um, Little John had been around since about uh, probably like 97-ish, I don't know. I don't know what year we made him, couldn't be a better player. But I could have had a lot of more things, a lot of more stuff in the works with Little John, a lot, a, a bigger catalog, if Jive Records didn't intervene. Jive Records was, uh, I would always like find some good shit and be like, man, y'all wanna, wanna take a look at it? And Little John, I was gonna, you know, I, I turned him on. I was like, check, check the homie out, like, he got that shit. Like, I was like, that's the guy. And they told me, oh yeah, we know about Little John. He's, he's hot, but it's, he's pretty much um, that Northeast, like uh, that Southeast. He's never gonna leave that region. Like, mm -hmm. that's, 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 a, that's a local sound. It's never gonna, they were talking about that, like, crunk that bounce. Cause like, that's never gonna leave that area. I was like, all right. And then, um, Little John was signed to TBT Records. He got a deal with TBT. He, um, he almost got caught up in a situation where he couldn't do shit. He was signed to some indie label that wouldn't let him out the contract. And I came in, got Little John out of his contract. What didn't take much, was no miracle, just was like, some money and some, you know, just like, come on, that's my folks, whatever. It was all, it wasn't shit. And I tried to get him to jive. Jive didn't want to fuck with him, so he got a deal with TVT. And TVT asked Jive, how much can we pay you to do, to use Too Short for eight songs on a project that Lil John's doing? They said, uh, we'll give you a dollar a record. So no matter what TVT and Lil John agreed to give me, they was gonna give Jive a dollar record just to borrow me for eight songs. And Jive turned it down. And I was just like, 
you know, I was like, what the fuck is that about? Like, this, this, this is about to be some big shit. And it went on to be a big project, too. I don't know which one it was, but it was a, a compilation Lil John did that had hits on it. And I was supposed to be on it. I probably was on it, but I, was on, I wasn't on eight fucking songs. And next thing I know, Jive is paying Lil John top dollar, the same motherfucker who they told me don't, don't bring him around, to produce Usher and Pete Pablo and all these other motherfuckers. They was, they, he was their go-to guy. Got some E-40 songs. Like, he was giving them hits. And I go back and go, I thought you guys didn't like this dude. <laughs> They're like, oh, no, no, as a producer, I'm like, oh, trying to double talk or, or he got better or something. I'm like, man, fuck y'all. Like, it was, a, it was, with them, it was more like business as usual. Like, short is right, this guy's hot. But we don't want to fuck with him too short. So they go back all the way around the motherfucking world for six month, 12 month swindle and go back and start doing big business with the homie. Which, well, I've never been that guy who was like, you know, trying to go like fucking start a war or some shit behind some bullshit like that. But at the same time, I was like, my guy? You gonna stop me from working with my guy? And then you gonna work with him? So that was, that was like the, the part where me and Jai, we just, we just, the friendship was like over with for probably like the last two, three albums. It was like a wrap. Okay, but you would drop like, what? How many albums with them? Like seven or eight? One, two, three, four. Yeah, we, five, we lost the six, love like seven, around um eight. Can't stay away was Jive? Yeah. We lost the love. You nasty like, was Jive? Yeah. Chase all the of, Cat? All the way up until ten, fucking, ten albums? It was more than that. It was like twelve of them other Twelve albums. You nasty, Chase the Cat. Might have been uh, more than fucking. What's that, my man? favorite word? Married to the game. Okay, so you a so at, after a while, they just stopped doing anything. Like they, they, not even to the point where, you know, you couldn't even get a two-week promo run out. You couldn't get shit. Like they, they, yeah. didn't, they didn't even promote "Blow the Whistle." They put right. that shit out and like, nah, it's all right. Which "Blow the Whistle" ended up being your one of your biggest songs ever. Probably it Probably surpassed the, everything. Yeah, biggest song ever. Yeah, with, with incredible beat. The label Barry Wise apologized, but at the time <laughs> they they said, um, oh, "We don't have any budget to promote that." It's you know, it's a West Coast record. Like they always say, man, Jive did not get it, man. Most labels don't get it though. Right. And then Jay Z ended Jive. up jumping on it, did a freestyle on it, and it get, got new wings. It just, it just, it just, it just kept going. It go, it's still, I hear the motherfucker every time I go to the club. Yeah. I hear the motherfucker when I'm walking in the club is playing. And I'm like, I know they don't know I'm here because I'm just walking in. Yeah. So shit, it's cool. It's a, it's a blessing.